All right. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Thanks for thanks for doing this. It's really thanks good to for see having you guys. us. Yeah, we're really excited to be here. We are really excited to have um, very very amazing people on the first episode of our podcast. We have Amber Nash, who is the voice of Pam Poovy on Archer and longtime ensemble member of Dad's Garage Theater Company, and. Her husband, Kevin Galise, a writer, producer, and improviser from Canada who just finished 10 years as artistic director of Dad's Garage in Atlanta. We're really excited about the projects that you have coming up, specifically the movie that you have coming out, How to Ruin the Holidays. So we are so curious to find out more about this movie and why you guys decided to make this movie. Yeah, we, um, we made a short film together um, back in 2017, I think it was. And uh, it was uh, our first time where we were working with a, a group of uh, adults with different developmental and cognitive disabilities. So it was like a really broad uh, spectrum um, you know, everything from like autism or Down syndrome to like um, combinations of like learning disability with, their, you know, you get different combos. And so it's just, it was an amazing experience. We had so much fun and I, uh, I had never really combined my passion for that community with my passion for comedy before, because I don't know. It's intimidating to like talk about something that you care about a lot in a comedic way. It's like, you yeah. want to get it right. So, but anyways, after we did that project, it was like so amazing. And, and we just were so fired up that we decided to keep going down the path. And that led us to this project. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, now, wait, what's that, what's that short film called again? Uh, mm. The short film is called That Was Awesome. And you can find it on YouTube. If Perfect. you search Dad's Garage, and that was awesome. And it's a 17-minute um, sports. The genre would be like sports, you know? It's like a, it's a, yeah. And it's it's really funny and good, and I'm really proud of it. I'm really excited that you guys want to make art that has this type of representation because it's, it's not common. And usually when it is done, a lot of the time, it's only done from one perspective. And so I love you talking about diversity and different combinations of, of humans who are all different. It is very intimidating to talk about stuff like that. Like, for example, in the autism community, being an autism mom isn't really widely celebrated because it's like, well, you're not autistic, your child is, <laughs> that's not your identity, you know? So it's really mm -hmm. hard to talk about those things and find a way to create it where you bring people to the table that. Um, can speak from their own experience and their voice is heard. And that's what you guys are doing. And I just love it. Yeah. It's so cool because like diversity is finally becoming something that like everybody's like, yeah, that's an important thing, but we've, we've just started to barely scratch the surface. Like there's so much diversity is diverse. Like there, that means so many things. And so the more we start to open up and understand what all the different diversity is that we can access means all the different stories, which means more exciting art, which is just like good for everybody. It's good for audiences. It's good for representation. It's just, it's really exciting because it's like, it's almost like it's all about to crack open and we're about to just you know, be a be be able to experience so much more storytelling wise. So it's super exciting to just kind of be in in the middle of it and it happening right now. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's an exciting thing um, when when you're giving people the opportunity to like kind of um, for the first time see themselves on the screen, you know, and see themselves represented, and that's such an important thing. And so it's like. Um, it's so so exciting um, that that you guys are doing that, and so uh, this this new Kickstarter um, that you guys are are running uh, for the for the movie that's coming out. Um, 
Tell us a little bit about that and, and how that kind of got started. How? Yeah, Amber, go for it. Because I just realized I remember I'm remembering now a quote from Stephen King that is like okay. so applicable to uh, how I feel about uh, this project. So I want to look it up so I can say it to y'all. Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. So the Kickstarter kind of started. So Kevin told you about the short film that we made. So we made the short film. And then the lead of that film is a guy named Luke Davis. And we became good friends with Luke. And we were like, wow, this guy is incredible. Like he's a really great actor. Um, we'd seen him do some theatrical performances and we just kind of got to know him. He kept coming to our theater in Atlanta, dad's garage. And so we just got to know Luke more and more. And Kevin was like, wow, we've got to work with this guy again. So when Kevin started writing the script for How to Ruin the Holidays, he wrote it with Luke in mind and myself and Colin Lockery. Colin was signed on at the beginning before he started writing too, right, Kev? Yeah, I mean, um, well, we wrote it with him in mind and then we sent him the first draft and we're right. like, and would we're you like, ever do this? Yeah. And he was like, Hell yeah, I love you guys, let's do it. <laughs> so then Amazing. we were like, okay, we've got this script. So how do we make a movie? And movies are really expensive to make. Um, like even our budget is like under $200,000 and that's so small. Like movies cost so much money. It's really incredible once you start thinking about just things like, like I didn't realize this because I came from theater, but just things like renting cameras and lenses and just stuff like that is like so expensive. So we were like, we can do some funding on our own and with people we know that want to invest or that can invest, but the rest of it, it's got to come from somewhere else. And so we were like, well, let's see if we can crowdfund it. And so that's how we kind of started the ball rolling to do a Kickstarter. And the really cool thing is we have a guy that we're working with that's kind of coached us through how to have a successful Kickstarter campaign. And one of the right. things that I had never thought of that he, he is really part of his core value of how to do this is that it's not just about asking people for money to do your project. It's about asking people to be a part of your team so that people are like invested in your project. So even somebody that's like, hey, I can give you 10 bucks. They're still like, you know, two years from now when the movie comes out, they're like, I helped make that. Like I'm a part of this team. And so it really, it helps you like find your community for that project, which is a surprising and really cool part of crowdfunding. Absolutely. I'm so glad you decided to do it because it gives everybody a, a chance to be a part of this. And people really want to be a part of this because it's something that I think a lot of people have been wanting to see in film for a long time. And like you said, it's cracking open and they're like, I want in, you know, I want to be a part of what's happening. Our friend Lars, we asked him this morning, Hey, could you stop by and just check out our setup for audio and video? Just he's good at that kind of stuff. And we were like, just to have an oversight. And he, because he knew, um, well, because he loves us, obviously, but also because he knew you were coming on, he was like, oh, I could get to be a part of this in some small way, you know, even totally. if it's just making the mic work. Just getting the word out helps, you know. Um, okay. We found that. Um, when we get this project in front of the people that it's perfect for, they get really jazzed. And yeah. so we're kind of out there searching for the special people that will see this and go, this is perfect for me. This is exactly what I want from a movie. Um, so finding them is kind of the name of the game right now. And that, that like little promo video you guys had, I was like, who wouldn't want to be involved in this? This is like, amazing you know what i mean it's so so inclusive so i found this quote and i just want to drop it on yeah. you it's a little bit lengthy but i really like it's really beautifully articulated and it's how kind it kind of is on the subject of like being a comedian and then feeling like okay but this is the most important thing to me should i should i try to make this into my work into my art okay so this is the quote the most important things are the hardest to say they are the things you get ashamed of because words diminish them. Words shrink things that seemed limitless when they were in your head to no more than living size when they're brought out. But it's more than that. The most important things lie too close to wherever your secret heart is buried, like landmarks to a treasure your enemies would love to steal away. And you may make revelations that cost you dearly, only to have people look at you in a funny way, not understanding what you said at all, or why you thought it was so important that you almost cried while you were saying it. 
right? Absolutely. I mean, wow. Like, yeah. I love that. I love that. That's what I'm all about. A hundred percent. It's so worth it. And there is a cost. Yeah. For sure. There's a risk, you know, there's a danger. Um, things are precious. When something's precious, that means it's precious. It can't just be casually thrown about, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, we have this conversation all the time. Uh, we both do do stand up comedy here in Oregon and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so much fun to be obviously telling jokes, everything like that. And then, and then once you get to like a subject where you really want to send a me- like a, get the message across and it's something that's important to you, all of a sudden the, the stakes get a lot higher. You know what I mean? It's uh, it's, it's a little nerve wracking. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that we have a conversation about all the time. Right. And like you're making jokes about tacos and it's yeah. like, okay, if you don't get it right, you're fine right yeah exactly yeah 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 but it's, yeah if it's something like yeah some real life close to the heart stuff like you were saying yeah i love that quote that's amazing yeah that's a good one uh you'll have to send it send it to us so that we can read it again too because i'm always gonna love it um also so this kickstarter campaign tell us how can we find it where do we go what do we do um, it, the easiest way is go to how to ruin the holidays movie.com and that takes you straight to our Kickstarter page. Um, and like you said, there's the video on the Kickstarter page. The other fun stuff is like there's some stories and some background and there's great perks on there, like funny perks. Like what's the Python Wrangler one, Kevin? That's 50 bucks. Um, I think it's a hundred bucks and bucks. then you can get credited as a Python Wrangler in the film. And of course, there's no pythons in the film, uh, but I just love the idea of somebody that doesn't know about the Kickstarter watching the movie in five years and then being like, why do they have a hundred python wranglers? <laughs> I don't even remember any snakes. Yeah. Yeah, or 200. <laughs> I want to be one. That's I, yeah, that, something. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That is a definitely, that's an amazing that <laughs> also what a cool great. way to impress like a date like oh yeah by the way i wrangled pythons in this movie it's <laughs> in, the, it's in the credits i mean <laughs> yeah, for sure and they're like i love that oh let's watch it no we don't have to watch it there's no pythons <laughs> but we really wanted to make sure that it was like super accessible to everybody and that like it wasn't like a financial barrier if you wanted to like support so like even at the lowest level of 10 bucks mm-hmm. you still get like a a screener of the film you get like there's a window of time where you can watch the film so like you know that's cheaper than any other you know what i'm saying like going to a movie yeah. theater or watching it on itunes or whatever it's like right. we really wanted to make sure everybody could be involved if they want to be yeah oh we're gonna share the heck out of it too because even if people can't donate anything maybe they just don't have the funds right now and that's okay then they can still share and we are also going to share it for two reasons. Number one, we want you guys to um, have all the support that you can in making this movie. But also I want people to see this movie, you know, um, because it's important. And Mm. also it's going to be really funny. I, I can already tell. Um, So yeah, Yeah. personally, it means a lot to me that you would be on my podcast because there's a lot of people that are like, Oh, you know, we want to represent, people that are neurodiverse and we're going to create something um, about them, but they don't include those people. (laughs) Not only are you having people who really identify with the differences that you're like elevating in your film, but uh, you're having them be a part of it. And then you're on, uh, you came here on my podcast and let me talk to you. (laughs) So that's, that's really good for you because it shows like that you're not, Fake you're the orders. real deal you're yeah the real deal you know and like you guys heard about the saya movie right and you don't you don't have to talk about it i'm gonna talk about it but anyway i'm just gonna say no thank you to that and um you know it's like the opposite of that what you're doing so i'm really excited so thank you for doing this <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean the people you have involved in it it's uh it looks amazing and um yeah i am curious how did you meet colin how did you know him and be like oh yeah he's gonna be the dad how did that happen well um colin and i are both uh you know from the canadian improv world and so i had had um some small um interactions with him kind of 
throughout my career, but um, I guess maybe like, ah, uh, gosh, like almost let's say nine, 10 years ago uh, was the first time I invited him down to perform at dad's garage in Atlanta. Um, and uh, it went so well um, from kind of everybody's perspective. Like we loved working with him. He loved working with us. Audiences loved it. Media loved it. Like everybody was having a great time. So we just kept doing it. And then you flash forward like over 10 years of me running dads and like, Amber, can you even start to count the amount of projects we've done with Colin over the years? Like it's I'm so many, it's so many. And the other cool thing is, is like, we've had a lot of celebrity guests and they usually like do the show and then they go back to their hotel as soon as the show's over. But Colin, like after the first show, we were all kind of hanging out by the back door and he was like, so where are we going? And so we all, he went and had drinks with all us right. and it was just like, he's the coolest. And Colin is like a super famous person. Like people see him and they're like, oh my God, it's Colin Mockery. So the yeah. fact that he wanted to go to our like local dive bar and have beers with us was like the coolest thing ever. So yeah, so he's cool. been doing tons of stuff with us ever since then. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, he is really famous. I remember watching him when I was really little on Whose Line Is It Anyway? And when yeah. I watched the promo for this video, I was like, what? He's in it? That's crazy. That's so cool. Yeah. I was showing my kids like old, like, you know, Whose Line and trying to explain to them. And they're like, mom, I'm hungry. What are you talking about? You know, they don't have a clue uh, what's going on. Now I'll be cool for a while, for a little bit longer, maybe. Cool. Oh, that's amazing. You have an amazing cast that's coming together. This, this, that's, that's great. Um, yeah. That's so wonderful. Um, you know, I'm interested. You guys were talking about a little bit um, about uh, Dad's Garage and um, like how long that's been around. And um, Dad's has been around since 1995 when a bunch of grads from a theater program at uh, Florida State University. Um, had, you know, they were like doing improv together and they wanted to keep doing it. So they found a junky old tin can that they could rent in uh, Atlanta and started what ended up becoming a huge pillar of the arts and culture community here in this uh, city. That's awesome. That's great. So it's, um, it's a, it's an improv theater and, um, any other, any other types of shows that you guys put on there? Yeah, we do improv and we also have a full season of scripted work, which is not oh. very common. Most improv theaters do almost exclusively improv or maybe some stand up, but we're really lucky to also do uh, scripted plays, but they're always comedic and very much in our voice. So we always say that we're the gateway drug to theater because like lots of young people will be like, oh, it's dad's garage. I'm not going to see a play. I'm just going to see a cool show. And then we'll like give them theater. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like um, that. So yeah, it's a really fun place. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And the plays like allow us the opportunity to create shows that again is like kind of like an extension of improv, right? Like improv is a great tool for building your creativity. But when you take it to that next level is when you start taking those ideas that you formed and start trying to create a, a scripted show, you know? Um, like for example, Amber did her one woman show uh, at Dad's Garage. And um, I've written a number of different plays. Um, and and a, a lot of members of our kind of artistic family get the chance to do that. So it's, that's what's really cool about it. That's where I learned how to write scripts well, frankly. Yeah. Cool. Ooh, I That's love that. We're we're doing some sketch writing right now. We have a thing we're doing and mostly it's stand-ups and improvisers and we're all kind of adding that. It feels like Dad's Garage, it's like a like a garage band, but they disguise it and really it's a symphony. You know, you're taking your friend you're like come check out this garage band and then it's like a Broadway show or something a musical. Oh, really? I love that. That's really, that's actually like a really cool way to get people that don't think they're theater people realizing they are. Yeah. And the great thing too, is like you said, we, you know, we have improvisers, we have people that do stand up, we have actors. And then, you know, if you're a person that's trying to develop an idea or you have something that you want to work on, or you want to do a reading, you have all these amazing people with all these amazing talents kind of at your disposal to help you workshop stuff. Like it's really a great there's, and there's so many people that are part of the company now. So it's a, it's a pretty magical place. 
Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, we 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 have a we have like a similar type of place. It just reminds me of um, we had a place here in Salem called Capital City Theater, and um, they they're going through like a makeover through the pandemic, and they're going to be a uh, they combined with a music venue. And so now it's going to be infinity room, but it, it's the same type of energy where, where, you know, you get people from all walks of life come in and, and it's like this, uh, this creative atmosphere. And, um, it's, it's interesting how, how much, um, how many ideas can come out of improv just by getting together and starting with nothing. And then, um, so yeah, I was interested what you said, Kevin, about, about, how much can come from improv, you know, at first it's just improv and then you get all these ideas and it, it turns into shows and, and, you know, scripts and all, all kinds of things. Yeah. There's a, you know, a, a debate uh, sometimes about improv, about whether it's a product or a process. And of course it's both. Right. And sometimes more than the other um, more one than the other, I should say, but um yeah, you know, you can use improv and you can just make shows that are just improv shows. And those are amazing and incredible. And there's unbelievable stuff you can achieve there. Um, but then there's also like hybrid shows that have like some scripting and some improv. And those can also be amazing. And then, of course, you could use your improv to workshop and develop a script that ends up becoming completely 100% uh, scripted with no room for improv. And improv was still a big part of that journey. So yeah, there's a kind of a lot of ways it can go. Absolutely. I, uh, I love this conversation because it really, um, it just highlights the idea of this podcast and also the work you guys are even doing just about bringing everybody's differences together and collaborating. And I'm always telling everybody that I work with, like you guys, more people is better. We need more voices and you're good at this and I'm good at that. And if we come together, Hey, we might be able to actually make something awesome, you know. Also, I saw you guys work together at Dad's Garage, and we were that's how we met was at the Capital City Theater, which will be Infinity Room. But we share that that um, you know, sometimes not only does great art come out of it, but friendships and maybe even love. <laughs> Yay, that's great. <laughs> and also that. a lot of creative difference type, you know, conversations. Oh <laughs> we'll yeah. Come- conversation <laughs> we've never had that right amber no never <laughs> yeah i didn't think so yeah. i i i want to get into the questions that we asked you guys in the survey okay. because we read over your answers and they were really sweet and wonderful and interesting and we did have some questions so um okay. all right so the first question we asked is when you were a kid what did you want to be when you grew up and so amber what did you want to be? Um, I wanted to be a bus driver. And I don't exactly know why, but I'm guessing it was because it was like a, a person that had authority over me as a child. Like I wanted to be somebody <laughs> that could tell other kids what to do. Yes. Um, they got to drive this massive like machine that I thought was really cool. Um, and I guess that's kind of, the two things that were probably what excited me as a child. And Kevin laughed really hard when I said it, that I, I got to be an authority over other children because that's how I've lived my whole life. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I saw his reaction. I could see her laughing so hard. And I, I thought, I wonder if that's just like, because she's, she, that's her personality. Did you know this? Have you guys ever talked about this together? Um, <clears throat> we've never talked about it, but it's not surprising. I mean, anybody that knows us personally knows that Amber is like a thousand percent tougher than me in all ways, right? Like I might have like a big beard and like be a big guy, but I'm like very gentle and very like sensitive. Whereas Amber's like, oh, I get to boss around the kids and drive a massive bus. That's the job for me, man. <laughs> I love that. So have you ever gotten to drive a bus, Amber? I haven't actually. Oh. And now, now that I'm an adult and I understand like how <laughs> things can go wrong and that things are dangerous, I think I'd actually be afraid to drive a really big bus. Yeah. Um, but not when I was a kid. I would have totally done it if somebody allowed me. <laughs> yes. If you didn't know the risk, like you were totally down for it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you driven a U-Haul? <laughs> I think I've driven one of the small ones. That's so scary too. 
Yeah. yeah, I I I do not want to drive any type of large vehicle. I can barely drive my regular van. So no yeah. thank you. But that is hilarious. I love that answer. I love that little Amber was like, I want to be a bus driver when I grow up. That's just so fun. Um and okay, so Kevin, you wanted to be a comedian. Why? Oh, because I got a lot of joy out of trying to make people laugh. Uh, you know, if you if it works, if your joke works and they laugh, that's great. And if it fails and they laugh because of how badly your joke failed, that's not bad. You know, yeah. at least people are still getting some fun out of it. So, um, yeah, I always that was something I always wanted to do ever since it's I was little. So funny. I feel like, Kevin, you have one of the most pure, like, comedy careers of anybody like nobody else I know just was like I want to be a comedian and then they like their first job was doing improv like everybody I know like had a shitty job at a mall or worked at a you know fast food restaurant or waited tables or whatever but it's like when you talk to Kevin about his trajectory it was like I wanted to do this I started doing this and now I still do this and it's like what that's never happened in the history of comedians I feel like (laughs) Yeah. yeah i had a few joe jobs when i was a teenager like like when i was like 16 but like by the time i was 17 i was already paying my rent doing performance that's why amazing that's yeah. awesome yeah that's so good. Now, mind you my rent was so cheap back then so i didn't <laughs> have to make much <laughs> But still, that's something that's that's definitely not common i've never heard that either that's the first time i've ever heard a story like that um there's usually a lot more um like messy parts i mean i'm sure there were we don't know everything i'm sure it wasn't easy but i'm just saying like the fact that you had it in your head and you just went for it that's so cool did you when i was a kid i don't think i knew what a comedian was i knew what rock stars were that's what i wanted to be but like how did you know even what that was was there a comedian that you loved or no, I didn't, I didn't, I don't remember ever seeing any comedy um, at that age, like at the young, young age. I just remember generally understanding that a comedian was somebody that made people laugh. And that was my favorite thing was laughter. And so I was like, I think this is what I should be. Um, wow. And it somehow I ended up working out. I got really lucky. Let's be real. Like I got really lucky. I had, you know, a supportive family and I got opportunities young and, um, you know, I could keep going on about all the many, many (laughs) ways that I got so lucky. That's yeah, no, that's amazing. I, um, there is something, I guess, you know, being comedians ourselves, there's something like, um, it's something that like, it's very impactful when you make somebody laugh. It feels like, you know, it's, it's that, that it's overwhelming feeling. I think the first time I, I made a joke that I remember everyone laughing at, I cried. I started crying because I, I was a little kid and um, it was overwhelming. I was like, I don't know what to do next, you know? And so and they're like, why are you crying now? This is not the response. We like your joke. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's kind of like this. It rushes over you, you know? And so um, you're always kind of chasing that high a little bit. 100%. <laughs> yeah. It, it does feel good. I, I remember the first time I tried stand up, my best friend came with me and I told her, you're either going to laugh with me or at me. Either way, you're laughing. So it's good. And it reminded me of what you said. That's what it's uh, a win win. Yeah, you can't really go wrong. And if you're willing to make a fool of yourself and not take yourself too serious, seriously, like for others. I mean, I think for me, it's like I have always been weird and made people laugh even on accident just because I'm different. And so like, it just seemed like, oh, the stage is the only place I can be myself actually. And people don't get upset about it. So I'll just go there. You're allowed, you know, to be weird um, and celebrated for it on stage, like through art rather than like, whoa, that's a lot in this regular conversation, which it is. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. That's so true. Like, I feel like the place that I'm most comfortable in the world is when I'm on stage. And it's like classic problem with people in comedy. But, you know, the rest of my life, I'm like, God, if I could just, whatever that is, if I could take that with me around to other things that I have to do, it really is amazing how, how, 
accepting the stage can be. It can be very much the opposite too, but when it's when it's going well, it's pretty fantastic. You know, just uh, on the topic of that, I will say, um, and I haven't really actually ever spoken with anyone about this, but, um, well, Amber knows and, you know, my close friends know, but publicly not so much, uh, but it just feels like this is the most appropriate uh, podcast to mention. Uh, when I was getting to the end of my 10 years at Dad's Garage, um, I started getting um, panic attacks at like big events um, because I would be like organizing this big event and there would be like hundreds of people there. And I was feeling like everyone needed something from me. Like it was like, oh, uh, oh uh. and you know, I've been doing that for a long time, but I got to a point where it was really stressing me out. Like I couldn't like, I was like, I might need to drive away and just, but people would be like, well, can you go on stage? And I was like, that's the only place I can go right now. Like, <laughs> I cannot go yeah. to the green room. I cannot go to the lobby. I can't meet a donor. I can't meet anybody other than somebody in a scene on the stage. And that I can do all night long. And so even when I was like struggling a little bit um, with some of the pressures of, of running the company, um, the safe place to go and hide was on stage. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's funny. Yeah, uh, I, um, this guy. That's, that's, yeah, that's so relatable because, uh, you know, I, I, there's been times, you know, throughout, uh, I've, I've been doing improv for about like three years and there's times within those three years where you just have a really tough day, you're going through something really difficult and, um, you barely can make it to the theater. You, you know, it's just trying to survive the day. And then you get on stage and something like just clicks into place and you're like, all right, all right. You know, now I can take a deep breath. Now I can kind of, it's such a relief. It's it, which it seems like, um, I, I think it's hard to explain to people who don't perform, uh, because they're like, well, that would be the last place I would want to be if I'm going through a hard time. I'm like, no, that's the, that is the place to be it, it you know, mm -hmm. it, cause then you're fully in, you know, in the moment, you know, you don't have to worry about the daily struggles anymore. Um, I've seen this guy do it. And I was like, I don't know how you, how to do that. Because even when I'm a character, I'm really just myself. I'm not really very good at like pretending. Um, and also, uh, in improv, like there will be references. And I'm like, I have no idea what that is. I never know what's going on. I'm like, if it's about whales or cats or like something specific that I've researched, I get it. But all these references, I'm like clueless, you know, uh, but I've learned how to just make it my own thing and make the weirdness the thing. But like this guy, he would just have this stressful day and then get on stage and just be laughing and totally having a blast and letting go. And I was like, I do not know how you could do that, but it seems like it's almost a way to be somebody else for a minute and just forget about everything. And it's very, I know theater is a place where a lot of people have found healing a lot of our friends who do improv started doing it because their therapist told them it'd be good for them because they had like social anxiety or depression or something and then they found out they're awesome and hilarious and have become you know turned it into a career so mm -hmm. yeah I'm glad you shared that it's it's more common I think than we realize but a lot of the time people don't share stuff like that because they're worried about what people will think or they feel like they're the only one because no one ever does share. And then when we do, then we realize, Oh, we're all the same. I mean, we're different, but we all have something. So that's the point of this podcast. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate thank you. It. I mean, like I appreciate having an environment where I would feel comfortable talking about that, which is to say like, normally I don't talk about it, not because I'm ashamed or because I care what people think, it's just like, that's private to me. That's not your business. You know right. what I mean? But in this yeah. forum, I'm like, ah, uh, they're, they're cool. They're going to, they're going to have my back on this. You know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I bet somebody's listening right now. That's like encouraged, you know? Definitely. So for sure. Um, also that's why I wrote the specific questions that I wrote. I love to ask people. I always ask them, what did you want to be when you grew up? You know, that's like something I like to ask people because I feel like can instantly connect with like that little person. Some people sometimes are assholes, <laughs> right? But yeah. then when you find out what they wanted to be when they were little, you're like, dang it. Yeah. <laughs> you were a kid once and you're not, you have, they're like, I wanted to be an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's I never the it. answer, right? 
that's never the end. Well, we'll see. I yeah, think, I, I haven't heard it yet. Somebody that pro- no. Anyway, I um, I want to get to the next question. It says, "What is something strange about yourself that you like?" So I'll I'll let Kevin go first because um, Amber has gotten to go first this whole time. So <laughs> Kevin, you're on the spot. Um, well, we, um, I believe I said that the thing that's weird about me that I like is that I will cry during like commercials, like mm-hmm. that, if yeah, it's sentimental like, commercials. Yeah. Sentimental commercials. Yeah. So like, you know, if it's like a UPS commercial about, you know, but it's like about a daughter who's away from her dad for the first time. And then she gets a package and it's like her favorite cereal. And it's like, thinking of you, honey, I'm just like dying. <laughs> oh, I love that. I absolutely um, love that. And uh, that's why earlier when I shared that Stephen King quote, I almost cried then too. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, do you love that about him, Amber? <laughs> totally, because we're Aww. such opposites in that way. I'm a little bit more in touch with my feelings than I used to be, I think because of being around Kevin for so many years now. But yeah, absolutely. I love having a, a husband that's very in touch with his emotions. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, that's really sweet. Um, we I related about the like the whole bus part because and and this because Tony is really sensitive too. Did you guys see or hear about last night that UFC fighter, I think it was UFC, that broke his leg? Did you see this on the internet? Oh, 18 seconds into the fight, they kick, he kicks the dude and his leg breaks. So gnarly. And I was like, you have to see this right now. And he's like, ew. I'm not watching that. I'm like, no, I am. (laughs) I was like, you know, I'm sensitive about that. And I'm like, I'm not. It's. Mm -hmm. or sad news stories i'll be like did you hear about the sad thing that happened and it'll like ruin his day it takes it takes yeah it's it's all consuming you know it's like uh, i don't know when to how to block it out you know i mean it takes over a little bit um i'm desensitized he's got a big heart (laughs) i used to work in in a correctional facility with like at-risk youth and like nothing phases me. I'm just like, oh, okay, fine. You know, <laughs> that's happening. Fine. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it can kind of shut off the the emotional switch. You know, it's, it's funny here. that there's so many parallels between us because Amber has similar experience in her work history as well. Yeah, I worked at a, um, it was a therapeutic camp for children, but they would get sent there by the state. Um, and it was, uh, it was kind of like a group home, but in the woods and mm-hmm. same thing, like, you know, working with all different kinds of people with all different kinds of issues. And, and they're also teenagers. So like anything goes like they're smoking leaves out of a paper towel and you're just like, really, is that what we're doing today? So yeah, I totally <laughs> relate. Yeah. Yeah. They're so, I love working with teenagers. It's so much fun. And it's also like, those situations are so tough because they're kids, you know, it's not their fault. It's, it's yeah. probably mostly the parents and then they're in an institution, you know, and you become the family and it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to be in a place like that. Um, but it's also just a reality in the world that we live in. You know, I think everybody's doing the best they can, like as a society to help in those situations, you know? Yeah. But we could do better. Totally. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I actually didn't know that, that we shared that background. So that's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I also want to know your uh, weird thing about yourself, strange thing about yourself that you love. So you like to decorate cakes. What is, yeah. do you have like pictures of these cakes? Are you proud of them? Like, how do they I'm, turn out? No, I'm not proud of all of them, but I, it started when I, my first job in high school was working at Baskin Robbins, the ice cream place. And I became the only on staff cake decorator. And so I had to learn how to, the woman that owned the store taught me and a bunch of people, she had like a workshop and taught us how to decorate cakes. And then I kind of learned as I went and um, I learned, I mean, so this was when I was like 16 years old. So a long time ago, I learned how to decorate cakes and then I've had zero education of any new techniques since then. So I, I'm best with like, Um, like a writing tip. So if you want me to draw something or write something, like I can't make something three-dimensional, but I can draw it. But the thing that's weird is that I'm not good at drawing regularly. 
So if I draw like with a cake, like if I'm decorating a cake, like I draw like this, but most people would draw like this. So it's, uh, it's the way that I would, I've always been like an artist and a creative person, but I've always been like, I feel like I've been like, um, frustrated that I couldn't be like a visual artist in the way that I always imagined things. So cake decorating was like the one in for me some, for some reason that I could create things like in reality, like three dimensional things that were artistic. So, um, yeah, I started doing it a long time ago and didn't have just kept up with it. Like I do it, I decorate Christmas cookies every year with my niece and like, you know, stuff like that. So it's, um, I'm not always good at it. Sometimes it's terrible or it'll look cool, but you can't like really eat it because I'm not a good baker. <laughs> it doesn't always taste good. It just usually will look okay. So hold the Zoom call. Uh, Tony also worked at Baskin Robbins and he's told nice me about work. his cake decorating that's crazy yeah. yes what <laughs> so yeah yeah that's that was my same first job in high school and wow. uh i i was recruited as the cake decorator you know and if and i kind of got thrown into it so you kind of i had a couple people get mad at me because they bought this nice cake or whatever they get it from the freezer <laughs> and then they're like <laughs> i'm like oh no I, that's not how you spell the name and the kid's like, mommy, some guy made me a terrible birthday. They're like, oh, wow, I really got to get better. Uh, yeah, so you kind of learn on the fly, you know? And Yeah. And, and it being made out of ice cream totally is a different situation. So you have yeah. to, like, decorate in the cooler. Yeah, it's totally crazy. Yeah, you're, like, in a walk-in trying to not <laughs> – you're, like, shaking from yeah. being so cold, and you're trying to do perfect cursive. It's <laughs> – yeah, I, I I can definitely relate. It's because I I didn't do it after that, but it's kind of like every once in a while I try to, if I'm decorating cookies with the kids or something, um, I'm like, well, all right, let me shake off the rust. I got a yeah, thing or two for you guys. Yeah. Do. <laughs> yeah, he's got he's got some cookie moves for sure. I'm impressed. I must say, he's he's also like the visual artist. He's really good at visual art. I am just like you. Like when you said that, I was like, oh. Never heard someone articulate that before. Like I was frustrated that I wasn't able to create things the way that I imagined them visually. Yeah. Same. And I'm also very like perfectionist controlling. So art challenges me because you just kind of have to let go. And I'm like, but I want it like this, you know? Yeah. My thing that I found is collages because I just, I like words. So I just cut words out and glue them together, you know, that's great. Um, and that's my art. Uh, I just write. So that's just basically a writer's way of doing art. You just cut words out and like glue them together. And yeah. Um, but anyway, so I, I love this next question and I, I loved your answers. So I'm going to read it for you. Although this is the one that I would think you would remember it's, um, what is the proudest moment of your life? And Amber's answer was so sweet. She said, Mary and Kevin. <laughs> oh, I actually almost erased it. Cause I was like, that is so cheesy. <laughs> no, I love that. That it made me feel bad. Answer. I was like, Oh, I would never say something that nice. Now That's Kevin's so like, nice. Ugh, I, <laughs> That's I, the other thing I, thought of. I was like, I don't want to make Kevin feel bad. Cause his is like about his career and mine's about our awesome relationship. Now, I, I thought you meant like professionally. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, I'm never, looking nervous over there. I never thought that I would get married. And uh, I was 35 when we got married and I was like, you know, I was like, I, I I'm all about my career and I'm all about like, I, I don't need anybody to get in my way. And that's very much like how I was living my life. And then, um, you know, when Kevin and I started dating, I was like, oh, somebody can like be like be with me on this journey and help me with this journey. Like, it's not about somebody getting in my way. It's about like, li like, and that's exactly what it's been in our marriage and our creative life together. It's been so like helpful as opposed to it being like, you know, this person's just cramp on my style, you know? That's awesome. That's uh, yeah. What were you going to say? Oh, that's so sweet. And I don't think it's cheesy. I love sweet things. I, like, why is everybody like, oh, you're happy? Screw you. No, yeah. this is good. <laughs> this is wonderful. I'm so glad. And also, I am proud of you, too. Good job letting love in. It's not easy. And <laughs> yeah, it's scary, too, to, like, trust someone and 
to give yourself time to enjoy life rather than just going after everything that you know you have to do. So totally. What were you going to say? We're holding so I think, hands I during, think, your, during uh, your talk. We're like, oh, that's so I, sweet. I think that, um, no, I think you wrapped it up pretty well. I think, I think that's, that's awesome. You know, I think. Um, Are I, we going to get married one day? Absolutely. <laughs> we'll see. I'm finishing my divorce right now. So we'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> no, what? We haven't even gotten started on our divorce, so <laughs> <laughs> y'all are waiting. And so, Kevin, um, you, you didn't say marrying Amber, but that's okay. You didn't know. Are you, are you sure? I don't remember what I wrote, but I'm, <laughs> yeah. I think I said. Oh, Mary yeah, Amber. actually, you know what? I see here. That's what you put first, and then with you an had exclamation a point, <laughs> and then you had a second answer um, that said. Uh, uh, making our short film that was awesome, which is also something to be very proud of. Yeah, it was just, I mean, we talked about this already, so we don't need to go back into it, but it, I was really, really proud of, of of how that one turned out. Um, and it's like it's had such an impact on me and the trajectory of my life. And like, it's, yeah, it's just a really proud, proud moment for me like it was a bit of a turning point for you guys like you had been making art and having fun and loving people and then you did this thing where you put all of that together into a project and you were like whoa this is like a triple threat you know like we have everything here we have not just our passion and our art and we're working together it's like everything combined yeah i mean i think so i think that um you know, it's like, it's such a cliche that people talk about, like, when people say like, well, discovering your voice, you know, and that can be so much, so many different things, right? Um, but one of the things people talk about is like, well, what's the thing that only you could write, you know? And so then creating this like thing that's like hockey, so it's like, that's a part of, that's a big part of my family and my life and being Canadian and all that. And then like, you know, the, the, the disability um, piece of it, um, which is again, something I'm so connected to. And so like, I, it's such a big part of me, you know, but then also like trying to make it as funny as possible. I'm like, who else could write this? I don't think anyone else could write this. So it's like a cliche, but I was like, I found my voice through that project. I love that. Can you talk more about why um, that is such a big part of your life, the loving somebody with special needs? Yeah. So my younger brother, Mark, is he's just a year younger than me. Um, kind of like the Irish twin thing. Like my mom had four boys in five years. So like we're all <laughs> just this little crew of like troublemakers. But, you know, he's uh he's got a disability um it's like undefined so it's not like he has a tribe which in some ways is hard because it's not like you know if he had down syndrome then he could like connect with all that world you know what i mean or or whatever that specific diagnosis was but he doesn't like my parents are both doctors and they were just like yeah it just you just didn't we don't know, <laughs> you know? And yeah. so um, I grew up really close to him and we're really good friends. And so I'm kind of protective of him and I have a soft spot for him, but also we like joke around, like we message each other video messages almost every day. And it's always like dumb stuff that we're trying to make each other laugh. You know what I mean? So that's like a part of the relationship as well. And I just like never seen that in film and TV. It's like, it's like if you're a, a person with a disability or a person with special needs, which is like the vocabulary he uses. So I like to use that vocabulary as well, just when I'm referring to my brother, because that's his choice of words. Mm -hmm. But I know that's not everyone's choice of words. So this is just kind of like a generic disclaimer <laughs> to, to explain how I got there. Um, but anyways, um, uh, and now I've totally lost my train of thought. Anyways, the point is uh, I hadn't really seen like, people being used in film and TV um, that, that are from that community in a way that they get to be like funny and like make jokes, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And like, you know, 
and, and every project is different. So I don't want to judge all projects in, in this way, but like to be able to express the fullness of personality and life. And I feel like oftentimes people with special needs are ex kind of expressed in, in, um, in a narrower way. And so to get to be in like, and, and in this script for how to win the holidays, like there's some raunchy comedy. Like it's, it's like, it's not, it's not what people expect going in and neither was um, that was awesome. And so I think that's what like ha the people that have responded to it were surprised and like delighted that they were like, Oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. It was just an awesome comedy. Um, and so I think that's kind of also what you're, what you're trying to do with your work with particularly comedy. And you're like, it, we can express so much and expressing the full range of what any performer has to offer, as opposed to just being like, well, you're this, you know, any, anybody like, well, Amber, this is what you can do. And this is what you're going to express in all of your roles. And it's like, well, wait, there's so much more out there. Just to build off of that, because you, you made so many great points, Amber, and it reminded me of like, basically one way that I like to like express it, which is to say like, you know, every different type of people, every different group of people, the whole spectrum of human personalities exists there, you know? But like, for example, um, you know, you could talk about uh, people with the type of disabilities that my brother has, people with special needs, and they kind of get relegated to like this one thing, like sweet little angel that is like sweet as pie. And, and I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm sorry, but like, I've met all kinds of different of my brother's friends over the years. Sometimes they're just an asshole and that's okay. You yeah. can have down syndrome and be an asshole. In fact, to say that you can't do that is totally dehumanizing. You're saying, well, no, no, no. The whole spectrum of human experience doesn't apply to you. You only get to fit into this little bucket, you know? Yeah. And so that's, again, just kind of riffing off of what Amber was saying as far as like using comedy as a way of showing like, you could have really multifaceted personalities and it doesn't have to be so kind of stereotypical. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, that was a lot of that. That's what drew me in with, with your guys's uh, Kickstarter and your project is, is, um, you know, I think it, it feels like it's like a, a more honest representation of people from that community and, and, um, it, where they actually might see, see who they are within on the screen you know instead of being depicted and kind of the character being put into this little box of of who uh who the writer thinks that they might be you know so i love that yeah that's really great yes i'm so excited a lot of times i think <clears throat> just in my memory movies that are highlighting people with differences um or special needs or developmental disabilities and however you want to identify that it's just it's always like g-rated it feels it's always almost like a kid movie and it totally. has to have a nice bow on the end and be packaged like cutesy and be family friendly and uh that's really ironic because like being living through being different isn't really family friendly. <laughs> like that's the whole idea. Like it sucks. <laughs> and also it doesn't suck. It only sucks because some people don't understand and don't want to learn. You know, that's what sucks about it the most um, for me anyway, personally speaking. And so, yeah, like, I'm like, okay, now I know I'm autistic. Great. That explains a lot. Let me find movies with a lead role of an autistic female it like doesn't exist. And if it does exist, it's usually um, an autistic boy is the lead character. And then the, he has a girlfriend that's like the supporting actress, but she's not usually autistic. Like that just is not out there. And it's frustrating because not, then I'm like looking for characters that maybe are like kind of autistic, but not identified as autistic in movies. And I'm like, oh, that girl could have been, you know, <laughs> she's weird. Like I relate to her. I watched a few movies. I have a few characters where I'm like that girl, the writer might not know it. Maybe they did. I think she's autistic, you know, personally. Um, anyway. And uh, so I'm diagnosing movie characters now. That's my new role, <laughs> my new job. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I, um, I love 
I love those answers. And let's see, what was the last question? I, I forget. Oh, the, the proud moment. So yeah, that movie was great. And you did find your voice and now um, you're using it in a, in a different way, but in a similar direction. And so um, with that, the next question that I asked you guys on this survey was, what do you love about sharing life with people who are different than you? And if you notice the reason I specifically like chose these questions for two reasons. One, um, I, I intentionally ask questions that made you think about things. And I want people who come on here to be tricked into thinking positively about themselves. <laughs> like, what do you love that's strange about yourself? You mm-hmm. know, that's, Tricky, tricky. So yeah, the question again is, what do you love about sharing life with people who are different than you? And Amber, you said, I'm going to read it for you because it's a long, long answer. Okay. Says, Diversity means that we have more diverse stories, which makes for more interesting art. So yeah. I, I love that. Can you explain that? Yeah, uh, we, I, I touched on it a little bit earlier in that that kind of idea that we're kind of breaking open what diversity can actually mean and all the different um, places we can access and stories we can access. And it's just the more I've seen it in my life, like through theater, um, improv was very much a white male, like a white male in his 20s game. And the longer I've been in it, the more I've seen that world open up and and become more diverse and watch those stories become better and shows be more exciting and audiences look different. And so you just get to share more um, in the world when you're not just telling like one narrow story. And we're seeing it a lot in film and television too. And there's just more, there's more to to see and do, which is just exciting as an audience member and a consumer of art, but it's even more exciting as a producer of art. So I can't wait to just keep doing that and exploring. There's so many ways to explore, even things that I'm not even thinking about that the world's not even thinking about yet. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, Yeah. When it's, it's so refreshing to, to see a story because it, it just as a society, I feel like, uh, we're we're so used to the same story being told over and over again. Totally. You know what I mean? And and, and so, so many in the same like we see the same story with like a different coat on, and it's like I've seen this story so many times. Yeah, you're like you can't fool me. Yeah, this is the same exact story. Yeah. This is the same exact thing, same exact perspective. And so when you see something new, it's it's um, it's very refreshing. It's mm-hmm. it's you know it's it's absolutely wonderful. I love it. So. That's that's a great point. I think diversity in storytelling, um, it's just going to benefit everyone. You know, being able to kind of um, see things from a different perspective. I love it. And so, Kevin, you said um, the thing that you love about sharing life with people who are different than you. You said it helps me see the world in different ways and understand the world better. Um, and I think that goes hand in hand with Amber's answer. Um, and one way we can share what we see is through art, but what do you specifically mean? Or can you give us an example of some t- a time when you maybe met someone different and it helped you understand the world in a different way or a better way? Yeah. I mean, I feel like, um, there's so many different d- types of differences, <laughs> And, you know, so I could share stories about, you know, having friendships or close relationships with people that are different from me in so many different ways, right? Um, You know, transgender friends or, you know, people of different races or religions or um, on the, you know, neurodiversity spectrum. Um, But also like, you know, even just me and Amber who have a lot of similarities um, also were raised in different countries and have totally different um, ways of seeing certain things. So like, um, I know I'm just kind of, uh, kind of telling you what you already know. It's like that there's a lot, but I guess, I guess this is me setting up to like, just choose a random example and to say like, this is just the first thing that popped into my head, but I don't think that it's really all that different from any of the different types of stuff we've already just been talking about, which is um, I recently heard this thing about ask 
versus guest culture. Did you read about this or hear about this? Oh, what I think of when you say that is like, instead of assuming how to pronounce someone's name, if you don't know, don't just try to fumble through it and don't like make fun of it, especially if it's something foreign that you can't pronounce, just ask, how would you like me to say your name? Or how do I pronounce your name? Instead of like, is it blah, 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 blah you know? And uh, it's so scary to ask because I'm like, ah, oh, just figure it out. But I think that's what I would want someone to do instead of winding up sounding like racist, you know, like them sounding racist, <laughs> like they're I, just going to not try, you know. So um, so that's a totally interesting uh, uh, thing. And uh, I um, but but this this article that I read about ask versus guest culture was like basically like that there's two types of people in the world and they're, they're like we just kind of named this like this has been happening since the dawn of time and like this past year we finally were like hey let's uh, acknowledge this which is there's two types of people um the person who says like hey um just you never know unless you try just ask and what's the worst thing anyone could say is no you know and then there's the other type of person that's like you would never ask for anything unless you're already absolutely certain that the answer is yes. Because if you ask and you're forcing them to say no, then that's like so rude. You're putting them in such a bad position that they don't want to be in. So there's this two cultures that like clash because on the one hand, the ask culture, they're like, what's wrong with being honest and direct and communicating? And like, there's no guessing, I'm not jumping through hoops or trying to imagine, we're just talking directly with each other. And then the other person is like, you are an animal. Like, I can't believe you would ask me that, you know? And it makes people fight. And if you just understand the differences, then you don't need to fight because you understand why you're doing it this way, why I'm doing it that way. So I know this was like a such a long winded way and, and such a random specific thing, but like that's an example of like, you know, well, once you understand the different ways that people see things, it can help you be more like harmonious in the world, you know? Yeah, because also we couldn't have just one, like we have to have both or we would never get anywhere. And that goes with every example. Like we couldn't just have one of any type of thing because the world would be super boring, but also nothing would get accomplished because you have to have people that can drive things and you have to have people that can help people understand their feelings. And there's just so many different, you know, you have to have all of it. Definitely. Do you guys identify as one or the other individually? We're both yeah. both uh, assume or guess. So we just assume like I would never ask. Also, I think being Southern is part of that. But Kevin's not Southern. But Canadians are also known for being very like, you know, right. polite. Yeah. So I wonder if that has something to do with it. Yeah, we're guest culture all the way. <laughs> like, yeah, we yeah. would never, ever ask for anything unless we knew that you would want to give it to us <laughs> you know this it's an interesting dynamic because i'm also i'm i'm guess and um i can definitely say that kayla's ask 100 yeah. percent. she is it sounds a lot like ass i'm she, asked she, she's, <laughs> an, she's an ask man <laughs> For sure. Uh, I, I'm like, what's the problem? I don't know the answer. Tell me. I want to know. And, and why would you assume? Because sometimes we assume uh, and we're wrong, you know, and, and that's another kind of ass, right? The ass attitude. Totally. But like, I, I'm not trying to be negative. What I'm just saying is like, sometimes we, we don't realize how much people love us or how willing people would be to help. And, we don't know until we ask and there's no harm in asking. You don't know. And the worst thing they could say is no. My mom taught me that as a kid. So I've always just been like very, um, very bold in that without realizing I was being bold. I didn't know. That's just what I thought everybody did. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because sometimes we'll be talking to somebody and I'll, I'll have talked to the, the person we're talking to like a hundred times. And then all of a sudden Kayla's having these, this like deep, 
conversation with them because she had asked this certain question and like brought out this different side of them. I've never, never heard, you know, I'm like, wow. I, and she's like, well, you don't know if you don't ask, you know? And so, yeah. And so I, I really appreciate her perspective. I do not, um, it doesn't come naturally to me though. Yeah. I'm, de- yeah, <laughs> I'm definitely, yeah. It's helpful though. Cause the flip side is sometimes we'll be in a conversation and someone's like later, like I felt they will feel. And also I sometimes don't read social cues very well, but like they'll, they'll be offended. Like, I can't believe you would ask about that or something, you know, or, and I don't realize it's not something you should say. And he'll explain it to me. Like he'll translate the social situation. He'll be like, well, most people <laughs> wouldn't talk about that openly like I'm very open and not everybody is so it's like oh I didn't re- I wasn't trying to be like nosy I was just you were talking about it like you brought it up you know so it was uh, like I wanted to know how many times a week you have sex and I didn't yeah. realize What's that it was yeah. not an appropriate question you know I will <laughs> write like it the down. obvious next I will write it down. I'll make it down. we all yeah. want to know the answer <laughs> yeah. I just guess yeah um, <laughs> Also, you know, that's so, so true because I was in a friend's garage the other day. I thought I should mention this since you guys are comfortable in garages. Um, I, I, I was in a friend's garage and we had a conversation and we're really good friends, but we weren't really understanding one another. And it, I started to cry because I was like, I don't understand why you're upset. I just, uh, you know. I, I don't disagree with you. I'm just saying how I feel. And they were like, I'm not upset. It's just, you're not understanding. And I went to message them back and we're fine now, all the love, but I messaged them back and I said, sometimes, and I was speaking also from uh, someone who is autistic. I was like, sometimes I just don't understand things. And then I, I deleted it. And I put, sometimes I understand things differently because that felt better for me. Because the way that I felt about my perspective wasn't that it was that I didn't understand or that it was wrong. It was different, maybe even better, definitely better. But, (laughs) but, you know, it's like, uh, the reality is that sometimes people just realizing that other people can understand differently and it doesn't mean they're wrong. Yeah. It's a big step. Some people like never get there. Somebody (laughs) could have been explaining exactly what your friend was explaining or saying in a different way that you were like, yeah, I get it. And that's one of the things too, that you get, the the more you get close to a person, like when you're in a relationship for a really long time, it's like, oh, okay, your brain does not work the way that my brain does. And so I can't be mad at you for not understanding this thing that's really important to me or not at all important to me, because that's not how your brain works. And I can't expect you to feel the way that I feel or look at something the way that I look at something. And it's such a big, like growing up thing where you're just like, okay, all right. Not everybody lives inside this mind and understands and sees the world exactly like I do. And as frustrating as that might be to me, it's something that I have to get used to. Yeah. Yes. And then it opens up this whole new world of excitement of getting to think about how other people might see things. And totally. Think. And then yeah. be like, Oh wow. Like, like there's like, there's things that the way that Kevin sees the world and I'm just like, how liberating, like I'm envious of the way that you can experience this, you know? So just being able to like put yourself in somebody else's shoes like that is so cool. Yeah. And like uh, the way you do things, uh, what you guys are doing with, with the movie, everything, Sometimes I see a different perspective like shown to me in art in some type of way. Uh, and it, it totally, totally clicks for me. You know what I mean? Where I'm like, I totally understand uh, or I understand more how, how a certain person is feeling now because it was explained to me in, in, you know, in such an elegant way in art. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I think that's, that's why, you know, having those, uh, having diversity, in in art and all these different perspectives is so important because sometimes that's how it's going to click for people, you know, as a whole, you know, as, as so many people just will see it in a movie and they'll be like, Oh, now that, you know, it's a way to explain it to people a little Mm -hmm. little bit, you know, and comedy works the same way. Like, you know, just getting somebody to like laugh at something and then they're like, Oh, wait a minute. Now I understand Mm -hmm. that thing better too. Yeah. Yeah. Scientifically, I researched how to make people laugh. And it turns out that 
you know, the, re the real reason that laughter exists is because if you use it, um, you can get people's brains to actually, actually like physiologically open up in a different way to new ideas. Like laughter wow. releases certain chemicals that opens up people's brains and changes the chemistry so that they can hear new ideas. Um, so that's awesome. Yeah. So it's good that you're making this movie funny or else nobody is going <laughs> to <care. laughs> always thought of laughter as like um, an agreement or, uh, or an understanding, right? Yeah. It's like you set up and then you punchline and people connect the dots and then they get it and they laugh because they're with you. Right. Yeah. And so where, if you, if I'm taking you with me, where am I taking you? That's something I never really started thinking about until the last few years. But now I'm realizing like, oh yeah, this, so this, this laughter has this power. What am I doing with that power? You know? Yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. I think like um, the, <laughs> sometimes, well, a lot of times the best comedians, um, stand up is such a powerful, like, I think comedy in general, but you know, it seems like, um, there's been so many important points that come across and like perspective changes. And, and I think sometimes comedy is at the forefront of that a little bit, you know, where it's like, huh, well, I never really thought about it that way. And yes, they, it, with, with the power of laughter, they kind of, people are, are more open and perspective, perceptive to, to the changes. Mm -hmm. so that's awesome yeah and tacos are fine you know if you just yeah. want to talk about tacos that's good too because i it. love tacos and there's no harm in comedy that isn't a ted talk you know it's like you know yeah. for me for sure. though i can't i can't not do it because i'm like oh i have an opportunity to talk i'm going to talk about things that like speak to my highest intelligence or are important to me that i want mm -hmm. people to hear but also some people are like, dude, I'm just trying to chill. And that's heavy. You know, I just want to talk about like snacks and that's fine. <laughs> totally. I no mean, shame in that. we need all of these different voices, yeah. right? That's the whole thing that we're saying here is that yeah. like, whatever, wherever you're coming from, that's cool. Yeah. Um, that basically uh, was our last question. I asked, what do you value most in life? And you both said laughter. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same. I'd say I used to have people when I had a lot of little kids, like I still have them, but they were littler. That's what I mean. They're still around. Still around. <laughs> hey, yeah. Autistic women can have children and be good moms. <laughs> um, yes. Or at least the kids are still alive is what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I, I remember though, like when they're really little, you don't have time for hobbies. And I went to this like fancy dinner with some friends who were, some of them were doctors and they were older and they were talking about their hobbies. And they're like, I go scuba diving. I like to fly my helicopter. And I was like, oh my God, they're going to come to me and I'm going to have to answer. And I said, going to the bathroom alone. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what I said. But then I said, actually, probably um, laughter is my hobby. You know, anytime I get a chance, I laugh. And that's the thing I love to do the most. Um, and I think you too, you know, I, your whole family is so funny. He grew up in just like a really funny, fun family. So, yeah, that's, that's how you get attention where I'm from, you know, is, is you got to crack a joke and whoever's the quickest to the punchline, you know, it's like, um, I, you know, I'm from a big family. And so, you know, and, and it was, it was quick, you know, quick wit. And so, um, you kind of just like adapt to, to where you're from, you know? And so, um, and yeah, and laughter, I think always, um, like we were saying before, you know, it's a kind of a way to understand each other. So it's great. Yeah. Ha 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 ha. Laugh now. Ha ha ha. Laugh. Dude. I'm noticing that my cat is having a bath behind me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love it. I love that. <laughs> Oh, you know what's funny is I've been worried about if the microphone has been picking up this snoring beauty here. <laughs> <laughs> She's blending in with the couch. Yeah. <laughs> like camouflage. Um, it's funny that Tony, you and Kevin, you're you're both like these big hearts and so sensitive and you've got these big beards. <laughs> and from big yeah. families, though. <laughs> yeah. What'd you say? Oh, we're also both from really big yeah. families. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah. just a lot of 
big going on in in, in yeah. our for area. sure. <laughs> we Definitely. Al- we also have a cat, um, but today she decided to go outside, which she's not usually allowed to do, and she's in the tree right now. She won't oh, come oh. down. Uh oh. Yeah. I know. And I went up there and I was like, Gilda, Gilda, and she rolled her eyes at me like. Mm. And I'm like you know okay. what you need <laughs> Stay to in the save tree. the cat. Yeah, she's fine. She'll come down. Long legged Larry. And uh, you might not have heard of Long Legged Larry, but go onto YouTube and search for him because he's very good at saving cats. Really? <laughs> Thanks for the heads uh, up. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to have to look him up. <laughs> it's a really cute hit rap video about a frog that jumps really high and he d- uses his powers to like save people. It's like the <laughs> cutest thing ever. That's awesome. Oh, you're kidding. I thought you were serious. I thought it was a guy who did like cat noises it- and got them out of trees. I was like, good. We're going to need. <laughs> I seriously thought that's what you meant. And I was like, they're here for the Kickstarter campaign. But if you didn't hear that, most importantly, now you can save your cat out of a tree. You heard it here. No. Uh, Long legged Larry? Long legged Larry. He's, uh, yeah, he's just, he's a very adorable character. Um, I think you'll enjoy him. Definitely. Well, um, this brings us to our uh, basically our last question for you before we wrap things up. and then listen to long-legged Larry's rap. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, just one last question for you guys. Um, this is a two-part question. So um, number one, if you could meet anyone that are alive, who would it be and why? And then to follow up, if you could only bring one person with you to meet them, who would you bring with you and why? So Amber said... Dolly Parton. Solid. She's such a fun icon and so kind and just gets it. And she's Southern. And she said she would bring her friend Whitney. So, okay. I want to know like best, like the dream moment. Like where would you guys meet? And like, what would Whitney do? And why would you bring her? Like, if you could meet Dolly Parton, what would this be like? Oh my God. So, okay. We'd be like at a nice restaurant and like Dolly would be at another table with her husband who nobody ever sees. And I'd be with Whitney and I'd be like, Oh my God, that's Dolly. And Whitney's like, well, we're going to go talk to her. And I'm like, no, we're not. We're not going to bother her. She's having dinner. And Whitney's like, no, no, it's going to be fine. And then in the perfect way, Kevin's also very good friends with Whitney. Whitney's like, Whitney's like our Dolly. She's like blonde and fabulous and Southern and is just like the most fun, like person at a party. She would go over and in her perfect way with like out making Dolly uncomfortable at all, suggest that we all hang out and then we all have dinner and then we have like a bottle of wine each. And then we're all kind of tipsy. And Dolly's like, you know what? You should come back to my place. And then we all go back to Dolly's place and she shows up, show, like shows us all of her wigs. And then we spend the night and then she makes us biscuits the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've thought about this before. It feels like you put, the, that's amazing. I love it. I love this. Yeah. I also, I want to add that you wear her wigs baby probably because of the wine yeah. and the sleepover. We've all, over yeah we've all had wine so then we start we start putting the wigs on and dancing around in our pajamas that we borrowed from dolly yes <laughs> i love this and so is, silk? that's nice is, <laughs> is whitney an ask person i would say so right kev yes yeah. I would definitely say so. I hadn't thought about it till just now, but yes, Whitney is very much asked because yeah. she's you like, need her. to the point, it's yeah. like, she's like, we'll just say how you're thinking and I'm going to ask you what I need to know. And then we're good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause she initiated, she, you're like, she was, she knows how she goes over there and it's like not weird. And she says, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I love it. I love that. Yeah. And so um, Kevin, you said, um, sorry, I just gotta. Whew, I'm so excited about that Dolly Parton idea. I really gotta. <laughs> wow, like, that was great. I, I'm saying goodbye to that moment. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, I'm I'm so certain that Amber can predict my answer here. <laughs> oh yeah. I have good idea. Okay, try and guess. What do you think he said? I think he says Aesop Rock. You're right. Ding ding ding. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. You got it. Um. And okay, so tell us why, and also who would you who would you bring with you? I do you want me to read what you said? Uh sure. <laughs> okay, 
you said Aesop Rock and because they're your favorite rapper and you said somebody cool enough to break the tension and make me not look like the slobbering super fan that I am, but also someone boring enough that they wouldn't take all the attention, <laughs> which I think is a great answer. <laughs> That's a really good one. So yeah, it can't be Whitney. I was like, oh, it could be Whitney. No, nope, can't be Whitney. No, Whitney's too engaging. Yeah. Aesop Rock would be talking to Whitney all night, and I'd be yeah. like, Whitney, you, what are you doing to me? You know how important this is. <laughs> all right. That's that's cool. I love that. And, oh, and uh, he is the guy that made that long legged Larry song. Uh, oh, so. I was gonna say that's that's what I that's what I was gonna ask next. I was like, so is he the creator of Long Legged Larry, right? He is, and we even have a long legged Larry plushie in the office next to Amber there. <laughs> oh, get it? Yeah, yeah. You we just yeah. got him out because I'm I'm such a fan that when it came out, Amber ordered this for me. Oh, oh my gosh, that's so cool. <laughs> so he's that's so cute. Look at those legs. legs. <laughs> it's true to his name. I love this. I love that a lot. Um, so we're going to listen to this after. We're totally checking it out. You know that. Yeah, for sure. I, I haven't heard that that specific song but i've heard a lot of aesop rock and um i yeah I, I love it it's like talk about um you know using art to to talk about hard things and and you know get messages across i think that um that's that's something that he does really well it's really exciting and then uh the question of who would you want to meet and why and um i would want to meet you guys and <laughs> that is why you're here so thank you so much and if i if i could bring anybody i would bring tony because that's why, I'm here. That's, that's why I'm i here. love that so much <laughs> yeah really quick i gotta go on facebook and we gotta ask you these rapid fire questions okay okay there are not that many so don't worry okay only a hundred. No, <laughs> this one isn't a question. It just says, I've never been this jealous of anyone over anything in my life. <laughs> so, but then he ends up asking a question, he, right? Yeah. It says, why does, what does that sprawling back tattoo say? It is a Lord Byron poem um, that is about killing people. <laughs> Amazing. I, I can't, I can't recite it. Someone says you can buy a shirt that has it on the back. Yeah. Oh, whoa. Uh, that's a super fan. <laughs> okay. And then the next one. All right. And the next question is, um, what are the show's plan, uh, the show's plans for Jessica Walter's character? So Jessica Walter is my good friend that passed away. She was, she's on the show and she, um, we don't know what's going to happen with uh, the character of Mallory yet. Um, I think that there is a tribute planned. I know there's a tribute planned, but I'm not exactly sure. I haven't heard yet what's going to happen. Gotcha. I'm sorry about your friend. Thank you. Um, how often have you busted out laughing after recording your lines for Archer? So I get the scripts ahead of time. So I usually laugh on my own before I get there. But the fun thing is, is that the director, Casey Willis, is also an improviser and a very funny person. And oftentimes we'll kind of banter back and forth. And more often than not, he'll make me laugh or he'll be like, try it this way or tell me another line to say. And that's when we really get into laughing. That sounds like fun. So our friend Adam Schwartz, who connected us and helped this happen, asks, uh, what does holy shit snacks mean? Is it a term of excitement over snacks or are there snacks made or, or are they are there snacks made out of shit? <laughs> I think it can be whatever you want. I think that's the brilliance of holy shit snacks. <laughs> I think that it can be a term of excitement, a term of concern. Um, and I do think there probably are shit snacks out there or at least not snacks made out of shit but snacks that look like shit definitely <laughs> just got a shout out adam schwartz a hilarious uh, comedian with autism who uh is also a co-producer on our film so i just want to give him a little plug yeah absolutely and he <sighs> um he's also really kind and 
he has been talking to me and helped make this connection. And I'm very thankful for Adam and think he's very funny. And yeah, I'm just so thankful for him. It's been, yeah, it's been really great connecting with Adam. He's awesome. Yeah. Um, so last question from the internet, what was the initial reaction when you read the character and how much influence did you have on the progression of the character? That's such a great question. So in the beginning, the character was actually kind of boring. And but I was so excited to have a job on television that I didn't care. I would do anything. Yeah. Um, and the character really progressed into the amazing character that Pam is today. And I don't know how much input I had in the progression of the character, but I'd like to think it was some. I think that Adam, the writer, got to know us all better as actors and kind of that informed a lot of the characters. Um, so, yeah. That's awesome. I love that. That is a really good question to end on. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really fun. So we're really excited to have met you and to have had this time to talk and be together. And instead of being strangers, be strange together. Oh, put a nice little bow on it right yeah. there. I like this. Yes, I like that. My fucking <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Oh.